Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this special worship service for May 10th, year of our Lord, 2020. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome as we continue in the Eastertide season on this particular Sunday celebrating Mother's Day. And we have a special video compilation from Children's Ministry Director Ashley Murdoch. Looking forward to that today. As well as continuing to celebrate our 199th anniversary, the anniversary of the mission that began the church that we all know and love as First Presbyterian Church Starkville. So speaking of Mother's Day, not only for individual mothers, but also for our church, we give thanks and we turn to God now as we prepare for worship. Jennifer Blackburn's gonna lead us with a prelude.
This morning's call to worship is from Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. I'll read the first two verses, and you'll join with me at verse 3. So starting in verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now join with me. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today so grateful that you've brought us through another week, that you've sustained us through another week to come worship you, and that you've given us this special day to worship you with our mothers and uh, to, to be grateful for what you've given us through them. We ask that you would help us this week to remember who you are and remember what we are to do as a church. Give us ears to hear what you have to say and hearts that are open to your word as we go forward to worship you and to hear from Martin as he preaches. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, a good news message from our children's director, Ashley Murdoch. Good morning, guys. Happy Sunday and happy Mother's Day. I hope everyone's having a great day. I'm going to read a Bible verse. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. So today's time is to celebrate our mothers. And I've been thinking, how can I celebrate the mothers today? And what can I say about our moms at church? I wonder if we were at church with our kids, what they would say about their moms. I think about how close my head when I think about my mother is caring. The word that pops up in my head is funny. Caring. Magnificent. Personality. Kind. Nice. Helpful. Happy. Yes. <laughs> Loving. Coolest. Amazing. Mom's a caring mom. My mom's a loving mom. Generous. Cute. Stylish. Helpful. Loving. I love mommy. Mama is sweet. Outgoing. Fun. Really, really nice. Awesome! About mama. Kind. Great. Mama's the best. Kind. She is loving. She is caring. Of a role model. Of loving. Fun. Amazing. Loving. My mom. Happy mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, mama. It's nice. Smart. Beautiful. Okay. Great. Loving because she's always there when I need her. Kind because she's always nice to me. Love. I love mommy. I love mommy so much. She's kind. Caring. Strong. Loving. She's always there for me. I love my mom because she does my schoolwork with me and because she plays with me. She's sweet. Good. Loving. Caring. She's hardworking, loving, beautiful, sweet, dedicated, sweet, loving, crazy, thoughtful. Mom is special. Mom is beautiful. La, 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 la. Well, you heard it from your kids, filled with words of happiness, words of love. Happy Mother's Day from all of us at FPC.
Thank you, first Ashley and all our children, and then also Vivian, for that moving celebration of song as we all come together to seek the Lord. And we know that our true nourishment and grace and blessings come from God. So let's turn to him again in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you on this special Sunday rejoicing in the good news of the resurrection and giving thanks to you for all your blessings upon us, most especially today, giving thanks for the mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers among us and the ways, Lord, that you bring faith and truth, strength, courage, and abiding steadfast love through them to us in so many ways, Lord, we give thanks. We also continue to give thanks, Lord, for the church and the mission that led to our church and our 199th anniversary. Thank you, Lord, for our special opportunity to learn from our history this past Wednesday in a special Bible study and to continue that celebration this morning. Lord, we give thanks also for new light and new possibilities in our nation and in many places throughout the world, Lord, as we see progress in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, we pray for healing, insight for medical researchers and others, continued strength for all those who care for those who are ill and in need. And Lord, we especially pray during this season for business owners in our community, Lord, our schools, and all those normally engaged in outreach and social interaction, Lord, we pray for your continued blessings as new opportunities open up for us. We pray for recovery and healing of our means of support in our businesses during this season, as well as physical and medical healing. Lord, in all these things, we come before you and we pray in the way you teach us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us trust in the Lord and his mercy and grace for us. Let's join together saying what we believe, joining today in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we're going to sing a great hymn of faith, celebrating God's love, the love of God. Let's join together as Jennifer plays and we all respond. The words will be on the screen before you. Amen. We celebrate the love of God and let us turn to the Lord in prayer now. Almighty God, you do love us and your love, Lord, saves us and calls us into eternal communion with you through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, by the grace and presence of your Holy Spirit. And indeed, Lord, by your Holy Spirit now, open our hearts and souls to believe and to trust in you and to follow you in your call that we might live with you and for you. For your glory forever, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture today is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Hear now God's word. And they left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, in other words, over into Perea, the Transjordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, 
For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. This is a great day of celebration. We're in the season of Easter, rejoicing in the resurrection and in the power of God's love through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And of course, on this particular Sunday, we're also remembering and celebrating mothers and God's love that he brings us through mothers. But if you'll hear even the way I'm saying that, it's important that we get the order right. Love's order right. And understand, love's creator, love's cost, love's courage, and love's crown in the right order. Some years ago, a little girl went to a pediatrician, and the pediatrician was examining the little girl, checking her ears. He said, am I going to find Big Bird in here? No answer. Little girl was silent. Checking her heart, he said, am I going to find baby duck in here? And she said, Jesus is in my heart. Baby duck is on my underwear. She got the order right. It's important for us to remember the order right. The kingdom and Jesus' teaching of the kingdom to us tells us it's especially important for us to get the order right in the household and in the family. And as Jesus moves in these final weeks of his third and final year of public ministry on his way to Jerusalem, it's very notable to us, and we need to pay attention to this, that in Jesus' teaching to the crowds and to his disciples, Jesus is talking a lot about and answering questions a lot about the family and about what real covenant love is all about. We've been, for the last few Sundays, learning from Paul Miller's book, The J-Curve. And one of Paul Miller's testimonies is particularly poignant to me uh, in this season and most certainly on this Sunday. Paul Miller share, shares about how he and his wife, Jill, they married young. They had three children, all very healthy. Their fourth child, though, Kim, was born with a number of disabilities, autism, various other mental and physical debilities, and she actually had a syndrome which caused her to be unable to speak. When Miller grieves about this and talks about this, he talks about how this, uh, this combination of challenges with his and Jill's fourth child, the daughter Kim, with her multiple and severe mental and physical disabilities and this syndrome, which is known as 1-3-P-6, left Jill, his wife, uh, with a total change of life and much grief and many challenges. She lost, Jill did, a number of friendships through the coming years because, you know, Kim, their little daughter, was totally different than everyone else's child. And even in church life, mothering Kim was a different calling than the other mothers had. And this wasn't a suffering that you worked your way through and after a season in the valley, you know, everything was okay. It continued month after month, year after year, and actually became more pronounced. The difference with Kim became more pronounced as she grew older. It was a total change of life in many ways for Jill as a mother, as a wife, and as a friend in the community and in the church, Paul Miller describes it as one long lament for his wife, Jill. Things kept getting harder and harder to the point where the Miller's children at, 
uh, some years later range from the ages of the oldest one being 16 all the way down through age six. And Kim was around nine years old. And Paul Miller remembers one night when he and his wife were both very worn out heading up the stairs of their home, his wife, Jill, turned to him and said, do you love me? And he assured her, yes, of course, honey, I love you. She walked a few more steps and turned around again and said, do you love me? He said, yes, and protested further and said, of course, I love you, and started naming off all the things that he did for her and uh, how he always was there for her and she got to the landing and she, one more time she asked him three times kind of reminiscent for us from the bible of jesus asking peter three times she said do you love me and at this point paul was very frustrated as a man as a human being as a husband <laughs> he, he tried to say some things but honestly by this third time of questioning and in the aftermath he was frustrated Miller describes going to the Lord in prayer following this encounter with his wife, who was really inconsolable, uh, not only that night, but in coming days. And Miller says that he was very frustrated in his prayers, and he poured his heart out to God. And he, he described the first phase of his prayers as being through gritted teeth. Lord, help me to show my wife that I love her. And then Miller describes, Paul Miller describes coming to a, a new season where his prayers were a little quieter, a little less frustrated. And phase two, he started praying a little more humbly, God, help me to love my wife. But Paul Miller says it was only when he came to the third and final phase of his prayer life did he actually open himself to our God, our Savior, the God of love. The third phase of prayer said he was very quiet and God was working a new humility in Paul Miller. And now Paul was praying, God, would you show me what love is? Would you show me, please, Lord, what love is? Getting the order right, love's creator, cost, courage, and crown. Key to God's gospel that Martin Luther and the other great reformers rediscovered during the time of the Protestant Reformation. They rediscovered and celebrated this as good news that God justifies us by faith alone. God chooses, saves, and accepts us by faith alone, not because we are good either through our works or, catch this, by our love for him. No, God chooses, saves, and accepts us because God's love for us is perfect. Jesus is perfect, and his work for our salvation is perfect and finished complete. We are not justified. This is the gospel. We are not justified by any mixture of God's love plus our love or God's saving grace plus our works in response. We are justified by faith alone and this is the gift of God. So, God doesn't find love in us and choose us because we're already loving him or because we're lovable in some way. Instead, we look in faith to Jesus and through Jesus and by his Holy Spirit, God begins to bring love in us. Martin Luther had this directly on point in the Heidelberg Disputation in his Thesis 28 when Luther said, the love of God does not first discover but instead creates what is pleasing in us. Let me repeat that. The love of God does not find in us what is pleasing to God but instead 
the love of God creates in us what is pleasing to God. Love never begins with us. Love never begins with us. Love always begins with God and his divine grace. That's love in its right order. Along those lines, we can turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Hear God's word. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Listen, verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Loving God and loving others. It comes from the creator of love, from God himself. He is the initiator and the author of any true love that springs forth within us, not only in our saving grace from God, but also in our grace toward others. C.S. Lewis says, you cannot love a fellow creature truly until you love God. Certainly it is good to get out of yourself and begin to care for and love another, but this is the way to avoid spiritual bankruptcy and ruin. But Lewis goes on, we shall not be well so long as we love and admire anything or anyone else more than we love and admire God. But for the Christian, for those of us who believe and have as our first love, God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, Lewis goes on and says this, because we love something more than this world, in other words, God and the kingdom of God, we love this world better than those who have no other love. So we turn to understanding love, we turn to the Lord himself, to the author of love, God who is love in himself, within the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is fully sufficient, fully loving within himself, and he spreads forth his love by his grace to us and in us and saves us in that grace. That's what we have to understand on Mother's Day and every day of the year. It's not really about us. It's really about him and his gracious work within us. From our scripture today, uh, obviously challenging passage regarding divorce and marriage. You can join me on Wednesday nights. We'll do further exposition of this passage and what Jesus is saying about marriage and divorce in our Bible study extensively on Wednesday night. Today, just a few notes. First of all, Jesus, as I mentioned, has gone south from Galilee. He's moved down to Judea, Marx tells us, and then also across the Jordan, in other words, into Perea. Now, that's important because Perea is within the jurisdiction, like Galilee is, southern and northern Galilee, in the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, who famously uh, executed, arrested, and then later beheaded John the Baptist because John the Baptist was criticizing Herod's divorce, Herod's wife's divorce, Herodias, who had divorced her husband in order to marry Herod Antipas. And uh, you may remember that John the Baptist was first arrested and then through further pressure from Herodias, uh, Herod Antipas ends up having John the Baptist beheaded. So Jesus is right there in the region near one of Herod Antipas's palaces, 
And this testing of Jesus, first of all, we need to be aware, this has directly to do with the Pharisees trying to go Jesus into getting in trouble with the ruler, Herod Antipas, the same way John the Baptist did. The second level of testing that's going on here is this. Deuteronomy chapter 24 provides protection for women under certain circumstances, providing for a divorce, a certificate of a divorce. Uh, during Jesus' day, there were two major rabbinic schools uh, on this issue of how far, what was the range of permissibility for divorce. Uh, the school of Shammai, which was more conservative and said only in the case of where indecency should be interpreted to mean outright adultery by the wife, or something close to adultery by the wife, then a man could uh, seek a certificate of divorce. But the, the school of Hillel, which was much more liberal or progressive on this issue, basically gave the husband, the man, full range to determine what uh, indecency was. And it could be anything from he just was tired of his wife or they just weren't getting along very well or he didn't like the way she prepared meals or kept the house or, or whatever else. Remember, we're 2,000 years ago. Jesus turns this testing question around. And again, we'll talk about this more in Bible study, but just for today, let me make this clear. This goes back to our central point that to understand love, we have to go to the creator and the creator's purposes and the creator's love. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. Increasingly, what had been established as a protection for women had been used and abused by men as a bridge to get out of marriages. And that's the way, particularly the Hillelian uh, school was taking this provision from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 24. So notice, Jesus says in this language, what did Moses command you? The Pharisees are proficient enough students of the law that they understand that Deuteronomy 24 is, it provides a commandment of a permissibility, but it's not actually a direct command. And so they say, well, they want to go to Deuteronomy 24, though. So they say, well, Moses allowed, permitted uh, divorces um, under certain circumstances. Jesus says all of this is a result of our fallen world, and men are abusing uh, the provision of Deuteronomy 24. So he takes us back to our creator and the creator's love and the creator's purposes and the way he has made us. And Jesus says, at the heart of who we are as human beings made in the image of God, God creates us male and female. Now remember, when God creates us male and female, both female and male are in the image of God. So Jesus is making a strong point about the value and God's love for women in the midst of this conversation. And then Jesus says, male and female, and of course, highly provocative language for our day with all different kinds of understandings of gender, but Jesus says, male and female. This is God's creation ordinance. And flowing from that, God gives us this ordinance, this blessing, this means of grace within the household of marriage. And a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh, so they should not be separated. This is pre-fall the way God intended. This is how we are made as human beings. This is love. So, a couple other notes. Jesus, again, as I've said, is upholding women in the midst of this. It's interesting that Jesus says that if a man leaves the wife and marries another... He's committing adultery against her. Now, under standard Jewish law, it was understood that a husband uh, would be potentially violating her father, the wife's father, her family, her family honor. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The woman equally before God is valued here. And Jesus is protecting women, and he's also upholding women. And thirdly, he's holding women equally responsible for some choices, like Herodias, who has divorced, actually, Herod Antipas's brother, his own brother, to marry Herod Antipas. So, love's cost. Well, if we're going to talk about staying in marriages and thriving in marriages, and we're going to talk about parenting children, we're going to have to start talking about cost, but of course, that derives directly 
and connects directly with the deeper and abiding story of our salvation. Throughout the scripture, love is not described as simply a feeling or a passing fancy, but a matter of covenant faithfulness and follow through. This is the way the key verbs of the Bible are all written. Uh, for, for instance, if you're going to talk about listening and hearing someone, shema, then, then you're talking about not simply hearing what they're saying, but actually following through on and following what they're saying. Likewise, in the Hebrew, ahava, uh, to, to love doesn't simply mean you have nice, warm, fuzzy feelings towards someone for a season. It means covenant commitment. And another Hebrew word here, chesed, means steadfast love. Now, in, in the ancient covenants between kings, they bound themselves to love each other when they became covenant partners, these kings did. Do you think necessarily all kings had warm, fuzzy feelings about each other and wanted to write poetry for each other? No, that's not what this kind of love is talking about in the Bible. The Bible is talking about a love that makes commitment and is loyal through thick and thin. And, and so when the scripture, when the Bible talks about love in the context of family, in the context of marriage, in the context of parenting children, it is a costly love and a covenant commitment love. That's what we're talking about here. Um, Paul Miller, back to the Miller story, talks about how as he prayed for the Lord to teach him how to love, to show him what love was, the Lord turned him to look to Jesus. And the writings of the Apostle Paul were particularly meaningful to Paul Miller. As Miller learned in a new way how to love his wife and the mother of his children. Miller said that he realized, and he was convicted about this, that he tended to want to have fixes in his family and fixes in his marriage and fixes in his love to come up with his own solutions. But what the Lord was bringing Miller to understand, Paul Miller to understand, is it's not about our human fixes or solutions. It's about God's grace in the midst of it all. And so Miller turned to the message of Philippians chapter 2. Now, Reed opened from Philippians chapter 2 with us in our call to worship. Let's just pick up at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul Miller talks about how he was braced by, confronted by, the seven steps down that Jesus took. If you read back through the first part of that Christ hymn in Ephesians chapter 2, you'll see the seven steps down. Jesus just keeps going down. See, a lot of times we enter into love relationships. We say, well, there'll be a few bumps in the road, maybe a few little dips, but we'll basically be on the ascendant. That's why I'm marrying her. That's why she's marrying me. That's why we're having children, because... You know, it'll be challenging at times, but we're always going to be through a little bit of bumps moving up. But what the scripture teaches us and what life teaches us is sometimes we go way down in the valley and well beyond where we are comfortable in our marriages, in our relationships with our children, and then we face further challenges. So what the Lord was teaching Paul Miller in dealing with his own daughter, Kim, and coming to love her and love his wife, Jill, in new ways, was it wasn't about his systems. Paul Miller says, God overloads your systems to bring you to himself. And that's exactly what happened to Paul Miller. And the Lord taught Paul Miller the way of humility and the way of following Jesus. 
down in the valley further than he wanted to go and trusting him and in the power of his resurrection ultimately. Which brings us to not only love's cost, but also love's courage. To go down, it takes courage. And this is a courage that none of us have on our own. It must come from God and God's love working in us. It is a courage that calls us to real decision. C.S. Lewis famously writes that, you know what? If you don't want to get hurt, if you don't want to have any tragedies in your heart, in your heart of hearts, don't give yourself away to anybody. Don't love anybody else. Just lock your heart in a secure safe and never let it out. Never let it out because you're going to get hurt if you love other people. You're going to get hurt if you step out in giving yourself away. And then Lewis says, but if that's the move you make on this earth, then your heart, which will shrivel and become a black knot, will be ultimately safe in the one place where you don't ever have to worry about love again, hell. Alternatively, of course, we're called to love and give ourselves away in the way of Jesus Christ. I've already talked about Hebrew words for love, agape love. Agapeo means to, in part to give yourself away in love, and that's our call in Jesus Christ. So it takes courage, but it's a courage that comes from looking to Jesus and trusting in the Lord to work through our loving relationships and self-giving relationships with others. Finally, this brings us through the call of cost and courage and trusting that Jesus has already paid the ultimate cost, has already walked the way of active obedience for our salvation to the crown, to the crown. And part of that crown is recognizing that the crown and the kingdom come to us, not through what we do, but through who the Lord is and what he gives us. And Jesus so beautifully portrays that in his rebuke of his disciples. If you go back and look at verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Let me tell you something. That particular Greek verb, is assigned to Jesus only one time in all the New Testament, and it's right here. <laughs> when, when he is outraged over his disciples, whom he's just taught, by the way, earlier. Go back and look at Mark chapter 9. We hit this passage a couple weeks ago. When Jesus says, you've got to be willing to receive the least of these in order to receive the kingdom, here they are pushing these they're probably peasants. They're not significant people away who are bringing their children to have Jesus lay his hands on them and bless them. And perhaps his disciples are saying, hey, they're not old enough to believe anyway. Don't fool with them. Don't worry about them. Don't lay your hand on them and bless them. Poignant words for us right now when we're so worried about touching and contact, right? But Jesus rebukes his disciples and says, let the little children be brought to me. Let them come to me. For to such as these belongs the kingdom. Here's the crown of the kingdom. It's nothing that we've done. It's not from our love or lovability. These children are recognized as having nothing. Yet Jesus, our tender Savior, reaches out for them and says, to such as these belong the kingdom of God. And in fact, if you cannot become like a little child and come with your hands and heart wide open for God's love, You'll never enter the kingdom. This is the crown of love, the crown that is given by Jesus and his grace. And I hope and I pray today, especially on Mother's Day, that you will know real and lasting love, which comes from God as a gift. Come to the Lord. Come to Jesus. And may he lay his hand upon you, your household, your family, your children, and transform you in his abiding covenant, courageous, costly, but oh so worth it, everlasting crown of love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Join me in prayer.
Oh, Lord, we come before you and we give thanks for your gospel. And I pray that everyone participating in this worship right now by your Holy Spirit, that each one of us, Lord, would trust in and receive your gift of saving love through Jesus our Lord. Not trusting in ourselves, in what we do, in what we do for others or for you, not trusting in our love or lovability. But Lord, as children who bring nothing in our hands to receive your grace, your saving grace, and to enter the kingdom totally because of you and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.